now we're, <laughs> now, now we're live on the YouTube. But, so hey everybody. Um, basically what we wanted to do was sit down. We're not going to be doing a video in, um, today. So we wanted to talk about more um, answering your questions regarding shooting or us personally or how training's going or basically whatever. We wanted to interact with y'all. And also we want to announce who our guest is for... Uh, next so we can kind of give you an insight on what he is and what he does so y'all can come up with some questions that we can ask him because we're really excited about that so yeah we have had a lot of video submissions but even on top of that we've had so many questions so we figured um it would be it would be a good i've got one two three four five yeah if you see us right looking <laughs> around we don't know which camera to look to so i will periodically check instagram instagrams and the YouTube, so. Yeah, but anyway, so we figured instead of doing a video analysis for now, we're just gonna get on and answer some questions. Our main thing that we're focusing on right now is the YouTube. Uh, so we just have, as a side, uh, the Instagram accounts live. Um, so if you are watching on Instagram and you wanna watch us on the YouTube uh, channel, which is kind of like where everything is going to be, uh, head over there. It's just it, it's just search beyond the podium if you haven't uh, subscribed to us yet. Subscribe and uh, and then join us for the lives every live at five every Tuesday. Yep. But um, so we got uh, we got some people in right now. So we might as well just start. First of all, how are y'all handling coronavirus? I mean, how is it affecting everybody that's watching right now? I mean, are you back to work? Is life somewhat going normal? I mean, what's going on with you guys? Because here, I mean, I would say we're not, I mean, we're affected by it, but we're not really affected by it because we have the shooting range here. We're about and stuff too, by the way, y'all, so. Are we answering questions or asking questions? I'm, t I'm just <laughs> interacting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, we got one already. Because how do you compare, this is going to be hard to read sideways. I told you. How do you compare the shooting in the U.S. to the U.K.? Pros and cons from each. Uh, Target-wise in the U.K., th you guys have a little bit of a uh, think style for target settings. A, lo a lot more stuff up in the air. Uh, a lot of a lot more speed, um, and it's just different. I mean, we, you have a lot of driven towers, a lot of high towers. I think it's a lot of fun. Targets are different. They're a 110 millimeter instead of a 108, so they fly a little bit different. Aerodynamically, they hold their flight path longer and they hold their speed longer because there's less uh, uh, resistance um, going through the air because they're actually a thinner profile. Whoa! But so it's a little bit different. I, you know, I would say um, it's a little different, but it's fun. It's not really a big deal. A lot of people make a big deal out of it. Um, uh, so I'm not. I'm never really too about it. But I enjoy shooting over there, and I enjoy, enjoy shooting over here. I think I got some from, let me scroll back up here. Okay, Ro says, hey, hey Ro. Um, let me see, where'd he go? Okay, question from Instagram. How has your training been affected with coronavirus? Um, my training, it hasn't been affected too much from coronavirus because we have the, I have the training facility here, so I'm able to shoot when I want to shoot. Um, but at the same time, I've kind of had to like revamp my training because I'm not necessarily training for anything right now. All of our shoots are canceled. All of the World Cups are canceled. Um, and they have yet to be determined when they are going to uh, reschedule those. So. Basically, right now, I'm training just to maintain. I'm not necessarily training anything. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much how it's affected me. I don't know about you. How about you? Uh, I'm reading my Instagram, and Matt Fisher says, Wait a second, do I see a ring? No. <laughs> Sorry. No ring here. There's rings, but not on this one. Are you doing training or just shooting for fun with the, with the corona? Um, I mean, basically, you know, we, all, all my shoots are postponed to canceled. All Kaylee's yeah. shoots are postponed or canceled. Uh, I mean, we, we've had, like she said, we've had students here already doing some shooting here. We had a, we had a mock tournament a couple of days ago. That was really fun. 
Um, but I mean, we don't have any <clears throat> tournaments to go to right now. The next one I'm looking at going to is possibly the the Georgia State Championship at the Meadows, uh, maybe like about a month. Um, but other. So another question is, Kaylee, do you plan to travel the European Bunker Trap Circuit at some point? I would love to. I love, um, yeah, for sure. I would love to. Absolutely. That would be fun. <laughs> um, okay, we got another one. So I think this one's for you, Kaylee. Are the targets in, in Bunker Trap different than Sporting Clays? Well, I guess that's for both of us, never mind. Uh. Yeah, they're very different. It, wait, clarify that question, please, because do you mean, like, the actual target itself, like the density and the diameter of the target, or do you just mean how they're thrown? So clarify that. If you mean how they're thrown, well, the answer to both is yes. <laughs> so, um, but clarify that question, please. I would say that, th that how they're thrown is not different. I mean, you can easily see a bird that you would see in bunker in sporting clay. Yeah, there's definitely trap birds in bunker, but in sporting. Or yeah, in yeah, obviously they're in bunker, but yeah, there's definitely trap birds in sporting, but um, you don't really see too many. Like, I mean, the only one you're gonna see in sporting is like a going away one. You're not gonna have one that comes from out under you like a 45 degree left. Yeah. Most of the time, hmm. when? All the time. When? All the time. I have never seen one. In all the sporting that, in you've shot. In all the sporting I've shot, I have never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly you haven't been paying attention. Uh, oh, we got some questions over on YouTube. Um, Hi, David and Kaylee. Looks like New York is opening back up. Looking forward to the next lesson. Any news on Rochester? Actually, yes, I do have some good news for that. Um, and I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about it yet. Uh, but let's just put it... I'll do it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Anyways, Brooks bid for and I believe got the New York State Championship uh, at the end uh, of July, I believe, mid-July. And uh, so I'll be setting targets for that. Basically, what was supposed to happen is when I was going to be setting targets for the spring deuce there, uh, we was going to do a clinic right afterwards on the targets that I set um, for the New York State Championship. Uh, they're going to have me setting the targets for for uh, the events there. And then I'll be teaching 10 days straight there afterwards. I'll also be there probably about four days prior to the state championship getting ready. So I'm gonna be in Rochester for about two and a half weeks. Uh, and so it'll be good. And I'm really excited about that because um, you know, a huge pull factor of the lessons that we had for uh, after the spring deuce was that it was going to be done on targets that I set for a match. And so we're able to keep that cool characteristic of the uh, of the of the clinic, and so it's going to be really good. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. On top of that, I'm going to look for another time to put some lessons there too for another week. But that's at least so far. Cool. So let's talk about our guest that's coming on that we're interviewing tomorrow. That we're interviewing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. Okay. So we're interviewing uh, Matt Zanis, and he is, I'm not 100% sure his full, like, official title, but he's a doctor um, in, like, kind of, he's our, he's our sports physio, basically, for Team USA, and he's extremely educated in how uh, your mentality affects your performance and the chemical balance and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm pretty excited to, to interview him on that. And he's also at creating workout programs specifically for shooters. So it'll be really interesting to talk to him. So if y'all have questions pertaining to that, let us know and we will try to ask him some of those questions. Okay, so yeah, basically what what I'm really interested in is uh, you know I get a lot of questions and emails what can I do? I'm trying to be physically fit I'm trying to be active what can I do to improve my physical health for shooting and although you might not believe it shooting a pretty physical sport and being in good physical shape is important for it uh, it's important for the balance for the mobility for the control of the gun so we're gonna talk to him about things like that we're gonna talk to him about uh, like Kaylee said, the direct connection between how you're thinking and how that influences your body and then how to control that more. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, send us some questions uh, in an email. 
um, would be best, I think. Yeah. Just info at beyondthepodiumpodcast.com, and we'll ask them about it. Whether it be some, you know, another good, if you're having any type of physical problems trying to shoot, if, you have, if you're looking for advice on how to go through physical therapy for it, or, or uh, anything pertaining to physical fitness and shooting, um, be a good one to go for. Yeah. Question on here says, do you plan to go to the Crossville, Tennessee bunker competition next month? I haven't planned on going to that one, uh, but I might just because I'm kind of itching to get back to shooting in a competition. So I might be going to that. Um, but as of right now, I don't know. I don't have plans to go to it. I want to go to shoot to the Night Stalker, but it got canceled too. Everything's getting canceled. Yeah, I'm just reading through the... Um, someone wants to know if I'm going to shoot the Western Regional this year. Uh, I doubt... Um, just the timing of the schedule. I mean, here's the deal. You know, putting putting three regionals in five weeks on top of national championship and then uh, a world championship shortly after and then having to teach, um, practice, and all of those things all at the same time. It's very impossible uh, and hard for me to be able to do that um, because I'm, I'm in, I would literally have to be gone five weeks straight of just competing. Five weeks, straight, five weeks straight of teaching, not a problem. But five weeks straight of competing, you know, that's a, ser a serious expense and time away from students and stuff like that. So um, probably not. Probably going to go to some, some, some major shoots. Uh, I'll go to the national championship, world championship. Uh, I might go to uh, the regional um, in at Hopkins. I'll go to the regional in December in Florida. Uh, but other than that, I'm not really sure. State championship in Georgia is what I'm looking at right now. Uh, but we'll see. What else you got, Kaylee? Mm. This is really hard with all these different in, yeah. in, uh, like inputs of questions. Do we coach international skeet? No, I don't personally coach international skeet. Do you, would you, do you coach international yeah, skeet? Actually, yeah, I've shipped that before. Yeah, David kind of coaches international skeet. So basically here at the grounds, we have uh, American trap, we have international trap, and we have sporting clays um, and V-task. Uh, the only thing we don't have is skeet, not to say that we won't have skeet in the future, but me personally, no, I don't coach international ski I don't know I'm not knowledgeable enough about the form and the technique of it to coach it um, but David coaches it yeah I mean I do it specifically but I've had students yeah. come to me for lessons with it and mechanics and movement and stuff like that yeah um, but it's pretty easy to teach I mean you know shooting is shooting you, you can find problems in in body mechanics and movements pretty easily um, I had a good question over here from YouTube Andrew on YouTube says Thoughts on practice for sporting, especially for those that might only be able to get to a skeet range or trap field regularly because of budget, time, or other restrictions. Um, so that actually is a really good question because it's it, you know, if you look at demographically the amount of people that shoot sporting clays throughout the country, and where they're situated in relation to sporting clays ranges, a lot of them have a lot easier access to a skeet and trap range than they do a sporting range. Um, and on top of that, obviously, skeet and trap shooting is, more, is less expensive than, sh than shooting sporting. So, uh, you know, it, and a lot of people look at that as a disadvantage. But um, in all honesty, the, the, when I was younger, I would say that 80% of my practice on a skeet and trap field. Um, I would start every practice on a skeet field. I'd finish every practice on a skeet field. Um, and you have to you have to use that area and those traps creatively. Talk to your club if before you do this though. So, like I I had a bunch of different drills that I would use on the skeet range. So one is like the grid practice, um, where you're where you're shooting specific birds as crossers or quartering birds or quartering incoming birds, and you're just working further back and back and back. And on a skeet field, you can do that. I'd walk back past the parking lot, past the road into the into the um, into the woods which ended up being like 60 70 yard shots so i can practice a lot of distance every angle on the on the skeet field i also shoot a combination of skeet and trap so i'm shooting you know like a a, a high house tra a fixed trap bird low house fixed trap bird as rapport pair switching them around working on movement like that 
Um, and then on top of that, you can do a lot of stuff uh, working on mental practice. So I do these things called go home rounds where before I could start a, t a practice at all that day, I'd have to shoot a perfect 25 on skeet. And then after I got better at doing that, I would go and show up and shoot a round of skeet. And if I, if I missed one, like I would have to shoot a 25 to start my practice on the sporting phase course. And if I missed one, I'd go home, wouldn't get to practice. So uh, yeah, skeet and trap is really good practice and it's pretty valuable and don't, don't underestimate it. Uh, but, you, but get creative with it. Don't just shoot rounds of skeet and trap. Yeah, we talked about this um, a little bit. Actually, we talked about it quite a lot on our episode that's releasing tomorrow. We talked about you have to, I mean, obviously you want to understand target presentation and you want to have an inventory of different types of targets, but you can work on your technique and your mechanicals and the mental things that you're working on, no matter what target you're, you're shooting, um, then that's an excellent way of practicing no matter what target you're shooting or what you have to shoot. We're getting a lot of comments on YouTube. Yeah, uh, but what? That it's streaming. Yeah. 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 What well, if you're on YouTube and you're and it, and you're not um, oh. and it's pretty jumpy? It's because we're streaming on two different devices on Instagram. Uh, but we're gonna have to turn that off. <laughs> what do you think we should do? It's crooked. Sorry, guys. Let me answer these questions real quick before I jump off Instagram. Uh, do y'all ever get to Minnesota for? Why don't we just have the people on Instagram join us? Yeah, on? if y'all are. Oh my gosh, this is coming off. If y'all are on, the people on Instagram right now, head over to our YouTube, which is Beyond the Podium Podcast, and you'll see that it's live there, and uh, it will make the streaming a lot better. So I will save these questions and answer the questions I haven't gotten to yet. On, so thank y'all for joining us on Instagram. Yeah, if you didn't hear what Kaylee said, on my Instagram, we're heading over to YouTube. So sign off here, go to your YouTube app on your phone, search Beyond the Podium, uh, and then watch the live video. So thanks guys for joining us. Sorry that we don't have good enough bandwidth here to do this. All right, I don't even know how to end this. <laughs> and here we go. And then download it so you, we still have the questions. I don't need to do that. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. I'm thinking that this might help the YouTube video. Okay, shutting that off. Well, it didn't save. It didn't put the questions on there. It won't pop up. Well, then what's the point of saving the video? I don't know. You tell me. You're the one that told me to do it. Oh man. Okay. So <laughs> now we're on YouTube. <laughs> And let's well, <laughs> that was an unsuccessful that idea. That was my idea. I was trying to put in the people, let me start over. I was trying to put the people on the Instagram that don't have a YouTube account and incorporate them too because we get a ton of questions on uh, our social media like Instagram and Facebook and stuff. So I thought we could have, you know, my Instagram going, David's Instagram going, and the YouTube going. However, we live in Arkansas in the middle of nowhere, so we don't have good internet. So, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> also, while we're waiting for some of those people to join from Instagram, wanted to show y'all the new merch. We got the merch in. Yeah. And we know that it is taking a little bit longer to get that in. A couple of reasons. One, it is custom made to order, so we don't have an inventory. So whenever you choose something off the website, then it's custom made to whatever you chose off the website. And two, thanks to Corona, our factory is a lot slower than they normally would be. So We own you, a factory? Yeah. So wow. if you have placed an order and you're like, oh my gosh, this is taking forever, we know ours took forever too, and that's why it is taking so long. So, um, And if you haven't ordered anything... You should try. Yeah, Kay <laughs> Kaylee's stuff came in two days ago. I just yeah. got an email this morning saying that my stuff was shipped. And and just to put it into perspective for y'all, I ordered my stuff the day we pu put it up on the website. So almost three or four weeks ago, and it just now came in. So Corona slowed and everything down on top of it being custom made, like made to order. So just be patient if you have ordered stuff and you're kind of like where's that it's coming but it's really cool stuff i mean this yeah is it's really a nice. super i washed it in a 
like I would wash my normal clothes. Like I didn't take any extra precautions on washing it. And it, this one is 100% cotton. It is, it's, I think the coloring is pretty good on it. It's really comfortable. And there's a couple other different ones that I ordered too. Like I have the sweatshirt and a couple different shirts. And anyways, so we are testing them out. And so far, I, I like them. Yeah. For sure. Um, let's see. Somebody said, do we need a, a tower? Do, yeah, that's... Um, we have a tower. No, no, no. He's... This, he's oh, for the internet. Yeah. Oh, well, we have a tower to shoot off of, too. <laughs> here, Jack, here's the deal. If um, you and Doug can come down here and build us a cell tower and put it right in the middle of the shooting field mm -hmm. for so that we can get really good service to stream videos, but then also throw and targets. And shoot off of it. Yeah, also throw targets off of a thousand footer. I am in. That would be awesome. Yeah. We could host, you know that challenge we did, like the Tower Bird Challenge in England that we did? Yes. We could host like a month long or something, like, or maybe like a three month long, and when they come down for lessons, they could shoot the Tower Challenge yeah. and then have some sort of giveaway or winner. That would be really cool. What do y'all think about that? Because we have this huge shell pit down here. How tall do you think it is? Like 40 feet. Yeah, it's like, it's like 40 or 50 feet. Straight uh, cliffs. Yeah, just a straight cliff. And we if we built another 50 foot, 70 we have foot a 60, tower. We have a 60 footer. Yeah, we have a 60 footer already. But over there. We could we just built, move it. Yeah. Um, that would be an awesome tower challenge. We could make that whole shell pit right there. I wish I'm going to post a picture on beyond the podium, um, Instagram of the shell pit, just to kind of show y'all what we could do there. That whole thing over there could just be like the extreme shooter challenge, something or another. Well, that would be so fun. It's really good because you know, uh, all over the world that you travel, you run into a lot of weird terrain. And, um, a lot of times people are very unprepared you know like where i grew up my home course we had 30 40 foot shots below our feet uh and so that was something that i was really good at from the beginning when, when i started to travel around at the like 20 years ago most of the good shooters were from the san antonio uh, area or houston and dallas area and we had a a, a big shoot up north in kentucky once and um the you know it kind of even the playing field a little bit more so um the and, and i ended up doing really well there but if you don't if you don't have any experience shooting on crazy terrain it can really it, there's a lot of optical illusions that are going on there's a lot of weird stuff that happens and so this area over psych here you out yeah this area that we have over here not only can we shoot 40 f foot like be down in a pit 40 feet uh but we can also be on top of it shooting 40 foot straight below us um, and we also have like when the lodge is done, well, the lodge doesn't even have to be done because we have a cabin currently that people can come and stay at and are coming to stay at right now, but it would during hunting season. So we partner with, um, a quail preserves called uh, hall's quail preserve and I uh, really good friends with him. Um, but they are wanting to do a, uh, what's it called? Like a driven bird, like with the pheasants. I was called? reading comments. I have no idea what you're talking about. What's it called? Like the driven birds with the pheasants. What's the what's it's that driven called? shoot? Driven shoot. Yeah. So they have um, the capability to put on a driven shoot. So how cool would it be to be able to come here, practice that, practice all the driven birds, and then go to their tournament and shoot like actual pheasants and driven birds and all of that? We partner with them a lot, so that would be a lot of fun. It's the comment section on YouTube is going crazy right now. It's really, this is so much better. We're not going to be doing Instagram anymore. <laughs> it's we'll so much better. Okay. Okay, go, so go I got some questions. Um, so here's, and this is an interesting question. Um, uh, it says, Kaylee, does elevation ever factor into your choke selection since the air is thinner? For example, Colorado Springs versus Fort Benning. I've been told you can open your choke more in higher elevation. Uh. Yes, it does, but not to an extent that I think would be enough to matter. Um, when I go to places like Colorado Springs or Arizona, the air is a lot thinner, so the targets don't have to be thrown as hard to get to the distance. But it's not enough. Um, it's not enough of a change that would require a choke change modification. 
So for me, I just shoot the same choke that I practice with because here in Arkansas, the, the air is a lot thicker. It's pretty humid here. So um, they're, they're coming out there pretty fast to get to the distance. But no, I don't think it, it's not enough of a difference to need to change your choke. You can if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my approach to that is that, you know, I always <clears throat> try to look at something as the biggest net benefit I can possibly get. And for my own shooting, um, I have fixed chokes in my gun. And even when I had a gun that didn't have fixed chokes, I basically put yeah, them I in and let them rust. I, I re My chokes right now, I don't, Craig off, if they're listening, don't be mad. But I don't even think that I could get my chokes out without some sort of tool. Like I leave them in there and they're, they're in there, you know, for the long haul, for life, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So with choke tubes, um, a lot of people put effort in, now bunker might be different, but maybe not. Uh, but a lot of people put a lot of time and effort in thinking about which choke they can use or should use. Uh, and when I look at the biggest net benefit of what I can be doing with the time of deciding which choke to use or thinking about the air density or stuff like that or the humidity, um, if I just put that same amount of thought process and time uh, and effort into instead reading the bird better, coming up with a better plan, I get a better, yeah, will a choke change make a, a difference? Yes. Will it make more of a difference in spending that same amount of time instead of deliberating on chokes, deliberating on a plan or reading the bird better? I get more benefit out of the out of the latter. So um, that's all, you know I'm always trying to balance the right blend mm -hmm. of of strategy and approach and, and information. Yeah, unless you're do unless you're shooting shooting something crazy, you know that I mean like we were talking about like the tower challenge or something like that that you know you might want a little more choke or if there's something like you're shooting like a flurry or something that's really close up. I mean, I would think that would be the only time, but that would be planned ahead, obviously, if you were doing something like that. Ch change, I agree with David, like changing chokes during the round. I mean, you're, you're rarely going to come across a bird that's going to require you, that's going to be more of a benefit for you to either get a bigger choke or um, a smaller choke. And by big, I mean like a tighter choke um, or, a, or a more broad choke, I think. Uh, Bill... I'm going to mess up your last name, Bill. <laughs> Boosler. But he wants to know, in Bunker Trap, what is the best choke? Um, well, I shoot a um, improved modified on my bottom choke and a full on my top choke. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a best one to use, but somewhere between mod, I mod, I would say is pretty typical. I like it a little bit tighter. Um, just because that's how I train and that's what I prefer. But anywhere between mod and, and full is going to be a good, a safe bet for bunker. I did uh, a, with, with a clinic that I was doing in Texas, we had a bunch of kids. Uh, there was probably 30 of them. And we would do this every time. We'd do three clinics a year. We did this for probably five years. So we're looking at hundreds of people doing this test. Um, and we would take... Oh, B Bill Bissler is his last name. Okay. Well, that's hard to read. I don't know what that... Anyways, the... Um, so, we had all the kids take all their chokes and pattern every single one of them. And a lot of times, you, we would find on both aftermarket and um, OEM chokes uh, that the they wouldn't necessarily pattern what they were. Um, we'd have inconsistent patterns. Um, and then some chokes would, you know, like an IC would pattern just as good as the, you know, light mod on that specific group of chokes. And so basically what I'm saying is if you have a set of chokes, number one, realize that don't just take the marketing of the companies, yeah. uh, you know, don't just take the marketing as legitimate information. Do your own Te testing. Yeah, on test it. them out. And then find whatever choke works the best in your gun. Pretty and, much when you get your that. ammo that you like to shoot. Yeah. But you should start with Game Boy and then just finish the test there. Or Federal. <laughs> but uh, with the choke, I mean, seriously, test different chokes out. Not just brands, but constrictions. And just find the one that has the best consistent pattern. Leave it in there and you'll be good to go. Think about something else.
And just to give y'all a reference, when we were in England, I shot that high tower challenge, whatever that was. What was that? Just a that, ta- that it was tower. a t- tower challenge, and they were ridiculously hard. Like, what would you say the closest bird was on that tower challenge? I have no idea, but they like, were good. Like a guess, just so they have a, an idea. The closest tower bird was probably fifty yards. Okay, yeah. What? How far do you think that one was that I broke and I got so excited I forgot to shoot the second one? It was probably, it was probably ninety yards. Okay, a ninety-yard target that's that was thrown off a tower and it's like coming down like this, ninety yards. I broke that with an improved cylinder choke and a borrowed gun, and that, I mean, just, it was a ninety-millimeter Shondell. Yeah, just to give you a reference. Would that be my choke of choice? No. But can it break it? Yes. So there's not, like David was saying, I mean, do your research because there's not too much. I mean, if you change from a modified to an improved modified, it's more preference than enhancement, I would say. For chokes. In in most situations. For chokes, I had a a friend of mine from Ohio. His name is uh, Miles Badovic. And he, when I used to have a gun that had choke tubes, um, or threaded barrels. He made me uh, some like homemade chokes. He was a machinist, or is, and to this day I still think it's best chokes I've ever shot. But anyways, he made me a set of chokes for my gun, and they were both set at twenty thousands, so modified. And even though there's a lot of debate uh, online about the world record shot, uh, the Guinness World Book of Record shot is like one hundred and seven. Uh, yards that was done at the world championship in Northbrook this summer no exaggeration both lasered and stepped off um, at 167.5 yards multiple times I broke uh, a teal with now it was number five shot uh, number seven and a half wouldn't break anything out there but number five shot with a modified 170 yards basically so um, it's really about what your gun patterns best with Mm -hmm. We're probably gonna have to scroll back up there. I think there was some that we missed. Here? Mm-hmm. No, there's. It's good. Um, let's see. Somebody said a Range Rover would be nice for a good prize. I agree. If you're willing to donate that, <laughs> let's talk. So what they're <laughs> reference? That's Yorkshire clay pigeon yeah. shooting. What they're referencing is, um, and we'll have to have him on the podcast because you know. Um, uh, they they ha- I forget the name of the shoot there. Uh, I don't know if it's at Yorkshire Clay Shooting, but wherever it was, um, the the prize for straighting mm-hmm. the shoot was a uh, Range Rover. Yeah. And. Um, but they they got Range Rover to donate one, did, or did they buy it? I don't know. I think they well it, a lot of times the shoots like that they have when you say it's like a hole in one championship. Mm-hmm. There's uh, sponsors. Yeah, and yeah. you take insurance out that someone's you know you you basically set the targets to be impossible. Yeah. And then, but it happened one time. I bet we could set something. We, could, I don't, I highly doubt Range Rover would sponsor our shoot here, but Tesla. Tesla, I highly doubt would either. But <laughs> um, we, if that is something that y'all are interested in, um, we could set a really cool, really cool tower challenge down here. Yeah, maybe later. Yeah. When we have well, towers. when things, when th- obviously when we have towers and things are done, but we have, well, we have one tower in, mm-hmm. yeah. Um. Yeah, Jason, it was Mark Windsor uh, shooting game boards, but he shot the twenty five straight in the, in the thing and won a game, uh, won a Range Rover. It's a, it's the whole video is on YouTube. It's really cool. You should, everyone should watch it. What ammo do y'all shoot right now? Like, let us know what ammo you're shooting right now, because I'm curious. Very curious to see because we have some diversity here, and I want to know what kind of ammo that y'all shoot and what guns do y'all shoot. Are y'all over and under fans? You stick to automatics. What brand of gun do you shoot? Curious. So Bill said, "Is there an advantage with paper hauls versus plastic, and which do you use?" For me, or just Both in of general? Us. <coughs> Excuse me, it's not Corona. Um. I shoot federal papers. Um, I like the papers because of the smell, obviously. I think they're the best smelling shells in the entire world. Um, 
the downfall of the papers, I would say, is for me, they don't last as long, you know, like weather-wise. Hmm. Why are you staring at me like that? I don't know. I'm listening to what you're saying. I feel like you're fixing to contradict everything <laughs> I'm saying. Like, you, like you're listening to what I say, so you're like, mm, no. <laughs> uh, but I shoot, I, I sh have shot plastics and papers. I used to shoot Winchester um, double A's and they were plastic, but now I shoot federal papers. And I am partial to the papers. I just, I don't know why, but I like them. I don't, what do you, what do you think on the papers? Um, I love, papers are fun to shoot, uh, yeah. but, <clears throat> and I have no, I have no scientific evidence yeah, of, that's of, of what I'm I mean, I can't no give you a, a, evidence. yeah, I couldn't give you a, preference. I can't give you a good answer on that. Uh, but the, I can tell you that I, uh, I preference towards, uh, shooting, uh, plastic hauls. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, are you going to the new quad seal game board? Yeah, I'm going to answer that later. Uh, but I, you know, game board makes some amazing, pa uh, paper shells. Um, but I just like the, you know, plastic. The other thing is, um, yeah, I, I really don't have an answer for that. Either. Yeah, I don't. We don't know the science. Like, I haven't dug too much into the science. We would have to have Game Boy on or or Federal on and talk more about the science behind paper versus plastic. But for me, preference wise, I like the paper ones. If they could make a candle out of the Federal papers, man, that our whole house would smell like it. <laughs> um. So we have some, we have, uh, Bill says see, he shoots reloads. Yeah, I see, Halls, I see a lot of Winchester AA. Brian Ritz says he shoots a Garini. Trenton Cheers, Winchester AA, K80 Pro Sporter, 30-inch barrels. Brad Johnson is a Cole Special with Winchester Super Handicaps. Ooh, um, those are thumpers. Yeah. Uh, Ron Gamebore with a Parazzi. Um... Trevor shoots Winchester double A, ounce and an eighth, eleven forty five. Oh, that's a cool ounce and an eighth load. Uh, with the bread of six ninety two. Federal paper, one ounce, eleven eighty feet per second of his out of his L C Smith for side by side events. Nice. I love shooting yeah. side by side. Um, let's see. What do y'all think? Here's is, a good question. What are y'all more what is let me see how I want to say this. What are you more partial to shooting? Do you like parkour barrels soldered together barrels or do you like your barrels to be separate let me know that too because i'm interested in that as well okay so this question is can you explain the importance of antimony and har the hardness of the lead do you want me to go with that one mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay so the interesting thing that's a good question it is a good question uh so this is a lot of I'm going to get ripped apart for this opinion, but here's my opinion. So, obviously, uh, antimony is important, right? We, the hard, what antimony does is it is a, um, a harder metal than lead, okay? And so what they do is when they, when they create lead pellets, they put a blend of antimony in with the lead to make it harder so that it deforms less when it comes out of the uh, the barrel so basically it holds better pattern right but two things that is bad about having a very hard piece of metal flying through the air to hit uh, a clay target number one the harder you get with more antimony the lighter that the lead pellet becomes because antimony has a uh, uh, less density than lead so um, the more antimony you put in, the lighter that the pellet is. Therefore, the lighter the pellet is, the less energy transfer downrange that you have. So you always got to find, there's this very fine line between the percentage of antimony, so hardness and energy. It's very, very hard. I mean, physically and chemically impossible to get an extremely hard pellet with a lot of antimony that's also very heavy and carries energy down range so to get a shot that's hitting targets hard at long distances you have to have a heavier pellet 
Um, and so, you know, th that's I'm going to call them out on this. Uh, but the, the new Winchester AA uh, Diamond, whatever they're called, have 8% antimony. And they're advertising this as being something that is really good because it creates a really hard pellet. So it, it hits hard downrange. Okay. The industry average is maybe around a 5% antimony. 8% antimony influences the weight of the pellet. I mean, you're talking about more than 50% antimony uh, than a normal pellet. So uh, what you really want to look for is something around 5%. Uh, and, you know, don't fall for marketing about importance of antimony. Antimony is important to create a uniform pattern, but it's not good for creating energy downrange. And now it depends on what game you're shooting. If you're shooting feed task, and harder sporting class targets, you're gonna want a, a load that's built for more long range shots. So you, you're going to, to need energy transfer downrange. If you're a skeet shooter or an ATA trap shooter, uh, or you shoot a lot of charity events, you either need one of two things. You don't care about having hard shells, uh, uh, hard pellets because pattern doesn't matter to you because it's so close they can't de deform quickly. Or you want really hard antimony, high levels of antimony, so that um, because you're, the loss of energy within 20 yards is not a big deal. Uh, so I can go into it. I mean, I can go through like the atomic weight of all those things, but it's probably boring for a lot of you guys. Um, yeah, Art Miller says higher BB count though with higher antimony. Uh, yes, you do have a, a higher BB count. The um, what, Kaylee? Why don't you talk about something while I bring up some information? Right, talk about what? Anything you want. I can't read the questions. <laughs> They're too far away. That's interesting. I'd never. I mean, obviously, I know about that, but I don't know a lot of the science behind it. Mm -hmm. I would be one of those people that would read that and probably just trust what they were saying and not do a lot of research on it. Yeah, you know? there's a there's a lot of um there's a lot of misinformation out there and here's the, the deal. A lot of a lot of companies rely on your ability to buy into their marketing. When they talk about really high antimony, that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, it it it's just you know, marketing is okay. a there's yeah. a question. You got more? Well, I'm trying to read it. Where's my other phone? About, Can you grab me? let's see, about Kaylee's questions on barrels. What are your thoughts on the difference between barrels with hangers and, what does it say, one soldered together simply for looks or any performance difference? I can give you my thoughts on that and I'm sure David will have his own thoughts on it. Um, the main two difference on barrels with hangers. Uh, I shot for a very long time with barrels that had hangers on them. And it's good because you can switch up at any point um, how your gun is shooting when you want. Meaning like if you wanted to shoot 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, it's very simple to change that if your gun has hangers on it. Uh, the downfall of it is that they're slightly heavier Although now they've come out with some that are basically made out of titanium and aluminum and some, then, some things that are a little bit lighter, but they are a heavier set of barrels. The soldered together barrels, I think um, you don't have that luxury of being able to move the barrels, but you can always adjust that based off your stock, correct? How your stock fits you. I'm, I'm doing math in my head. Sorry. He never, this is a daily thing. He never listens to me, but um, <laughs> that's my opinion on it. It, um, you know, if you're shooting a game that, that, you know, there's never really a point to where you're going to be changing how your gun is shooting often. You know, once you kind of get where you want your gun to shoot, that's pretty much where it's going to shoot. So then you got to look at it from a perspective of which barrels do you move better. If I were shooting sporting clays, I would have 32 inch parkour barrels soldered together. There's no reason for me to change how I want that setup to, to be, and I like how they move. For bunker, I shoot uh, sporting barrels, so I do have a hanger 
on them. I don't ever change it, but it's just what I am partial to on, on Bunker. And I can go into that more another time, but that's my two cents on it. <laughs> okay, so I just did the math really quick. Sorry for not paying attention to Kaylee. But um, so the difference, talking about the, the atomic weight of antimony versus lead, um, lead's atomic weight is... Uh, 0.1134 grams per millimeter squared. Don't for, worry about that for right now. Anima is 0. 0.006684. So basically lead is 17 times heavier than antimony. Okay, the difference between an uh, 8% antimony, 7.5 shot, versus a 5% antimony, 7.5 shot, um, in a one ounce shell. So in uh with eight percent antimony you're looking at like around 353 pellets um and with uh let me see with um five percent antimony you're looking at about 348 pellets so might be wrong on that i just did the math like really quick in my head the difference in pellets versus um this is a one ounce shot, so you're restricted in the amount of weight that you can carry. Uh, but in terms of the energy transfer downrange, check this out. So at 8% antimony, you're looking at um, uh, four foot pounds per pellet. At 5% antimony, you're looking at averaged out five foot pounds per pellet. The difference with a whole ounce of shot is the difference between 1,400 foot-pounds of energy versus almost 1,800 foot-pounds of energy. That's for almost 400 foot-pounds of energy difference between 8% antimony and 5% antimony. That's a huge difference. Um, and so, and that's that's around 1,300 feet per second. So, so that's downfall? The downfall, yeah, the downside of a lot of antimony is you don't have energy transfer downrange you have a lighter shot column. Uh, like the, the, the heaviness of each pellet individually is less, so therefore it carries less energy downrange. So you're saying it doesn't go as far? It's gonna fall quicker? Well, yes, but also think of it when it hits a, pe a target. Right. Let's say you're shooting a target at 45 the yards. The impact's not as hard. Yeah, let's say, so if we did the math there and I'm correct that a seven and a half, 1300 feet per second shell carries five foot pounds of energy and the, and we're going to go by the the old tale of you need three pellets to break a target mm -hmm. okay let's say you need 15 foot pounds or 15 to 20 foot pounds of energy to break a target that's the difference between a five percent antimony shell mm -hmm. needing four pellets and an eight percent antimony shell needing five pellets you need mm -hmm. an extra pellet to break to just chip the target right. at 45 yards so, which is probably more because I didn't calculate the drop off in in speed and everything at thirteen hundred feet per second. So, um, so what would be a benefit of having that? Of having high antimony. Is there a benefit? The only benefit for high antimony is that it's harder, so therefore the pellets deform less. Uh, so your pattern will but stay. But is that more of a benefit if it takes more to hit the target? Well, so that's the thing is that now you know, like you have. Let's, let's talk about, um, I know a lot about game bore shot. So we've got the game bore shot, the diamond shot versus 8% antimony shot. Um, yeah, 8% antimony is harder, so it's going to deform less. Mm -hmm. But if you do something to the shot to, to make it uh, harder without changing the density, you're not going to have a deformation of pattern. So like the diamond shot, which has a lot of... Uh, really cool technology behind it in terms of how they put it together with the blend of stuff that they have I'm, that I'm not allowed to talk about. But the um, if you look it up, 5% uh, antimony shot, look at the pattern difference at 40 yards mm -hmm. between 5% antimony and, or like the game board, which is a 5% equivalent, um, and then uh, like an 8% antimony. It, there's a big, it's a big difference. This it's all a, marketing. This would be a really cool topic to get some ballistic experts behind yeah, it. Yeah, we can easily do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. So Trevor said, if you need one extra pellet to break a target, wouldn't the benefit be in having more pellets in the same load? Yeah, but if you're talking about five more pellets, it's not really, <laughs> it's not really a big deal. 
Um, let's see. Let's see, what else have we got? What are y'all's thoughts on that, what he just explained? Well, it's science. You can't argue with it. <laughs> well, no, I'm not arguing with it. I just want to know, like, did did y'all know that, or did David just enlighten you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reality of it is I did something really quick on my phone. So um, the uh, I know the, the difference in the numbers is big. I don't know, ex you know, I didn't do it as in-depth as I could uh, if I had some time. But... Um, yeah, that's cool. Let's see what else we got. Those toughest shaped birds below your feet and far above your head. That's an interesting question. Did you answer that? What is From it? Brad Johnson. I can't read them. So they're too far away, so really? probably not. Yeah, if you're sitting back here, I mean. You can't read that? I can, but it takes me a while to figure out the name and then try to read the thing. No wonder I'm a better shooter than you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Okay, so um, where was it? Basically, he asked, "Does does a um, parallel comb make it harder to shoot birds below your feet?" Oh, I did not answer that. Yeah, so um, a parallel. I need comb. to get something very quickly. Can I leave and yep. explain this? I'll be right back, guys. I'll be your host while David is gone. I know y'all just come here to listen to me anyway. No, just kidding. But um, while we're taking a short intermission, how's everybody's Tuesday going? <laughs> Annie's back. Okay. We brought his broken stock out. Trevor says, David goes by science, I go by appearance. That's why he's a world champion. <laughs> uh, David okay. is the most analytical person that I know. He, well, I can literally, he'll be on his phone doing something, and he'll, I'll be like, hey, what are you doing? And he'll tell me, I'm on my phone. Well, obviously, I see that you're on your phone, but like, what are you doing? Like, he is that analytical well, about Well, you didn't things. say, what are you doing on your phone? It's, it's, anyways, it's a daily <laughs> struggle. He makes me ask 30,000 questions before I can, and by the end of it, I'm just like, whatever, I don't, I don't even remember what I was asking in the <laughs> first place. Okay, so to answer the question about a, a parallel cone uh, influencing a shot, beneath. A, a shot below your feet, it will if you move incorrectly below your feet. So, can I have you scoot away? I know all you guys come to watch her, but I'm gonna have to take over the camera for a second. Okay, so, this is a stock. Uh, it's not a parallel comb. It has, it has one centimeter of drop from here to here, but it doesn't matter about because of what I'm about to explain. So, most people, when they shoot something below their feet, they'll take this, let's say that this is their normal uh, shooting position. When they go below their feet, they do this. So, did you see how my face slid back on the gun? If you have a parallel comb um, and you and you're doing that, you're making that mechanic by by bringing your body down, bringing the shoulder up, and the head comes back. A uh, parallel comb will, should theoretically keep your eye in the correct place. A non-parallel comb will not. But that is not the problem here. The problem is that you're moving incorrectly. To shoot something below your feet, what you should do is, so if I'm standing like this, I know you guys can't see me right now, but it's, if I'm standing like this, what I should do to get lower is bow at my waist. And, and you can see if I'm bowing at my waist and keeping a good central point of gravity right here, my head will not change on the stock. And that's what we're trying to do. So. Um, yeah, you can come back now. But that's that's the explanation of that question. Whether it be above or below your face, that's how you should do it. The, Trevor says the infamous broken stock. <laughs> um, what else we got? Let's see. Do you think barrel deformation caused by heat makes any difference at all? And do hangers help with this versus fixed mid rib? I would, are you not answering that? You go ahead. Okay. Um, 
the uh, so I mean number one you shouldn't be shooting a gun to the point of where the heat influences the point of impact of the barrel uh, that's a lot of shooting <laughs> two if you are um, and you don't have a choice to uh, I mean I would I don't really have a way around that <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Read the question again. Do you think barrel deformation caused by heat makes any difference at all? And do hangers help with this versus fixed mid rib? Hmm. To be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. I think if that was the case, I think it would affect it, but I don't know why you would be shooting it to that point. I would just say if I'm going to be spending fifteen thousand dollars a gun, it better not, uh, it better not shoot in a different direction when I shoot it a lot. <laughs> yeah, so stick with Craig off. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, what other ones we got? Hmm, there's a lot of questions here. That how's uh all right? How about we have um, we got a what time is it? We got thirty minutes before we have to be there, and it's fifteen minute drive. Yeah, so we have about five more minutes here. <laughs> yeah, let's do for the next five to ten minutes. We'll do uh, quick questions about non shooting related things. Yeah, yeah, we'll do a rapid fire question. So ask us any question at all not shooting related for the next five minutes we will sit here and answer them we're gonna have to wait 30 seconds for them to get that and if your first question is if i'm better at at shooting than david then the answer is yes the answer is no yes but that'd be a shooting related question i'm just getting that out in the air <laughs> <laughs> i really like um What? Okay, here's a question. Do you need me to read it? <laughs> I guess Seriously? Still, I still cannot read it from here. <laughs> what Nothing has eyes? changed in the next in the last thirty minutes. I cannot read Bailey, it. Bailey, I here. have a serious question for once. Do you think Olympic disciplines have more pressure surrounding them because of the pressure of representing your country on a world stage? Ooh, that's a good question. Um hmm. I would think, I would say it depends on the value you place on that. I mean, you, you know, it, you could shoot representing your country in the Olympics and that could be a very pressurized situation, but you know, what value am I putting on that shoot? That's essentially what causes pressure. Like if I put a lot of value on that shoot, whereas I'm thinking, you know, I'm here for my country, I have to shoot really good, I really want to win an Olympic medal, all of those things cause pressure. So to answer that question, I, th I would say it depends on how you look on it and what you consider being a pressurized situation. For me, I look at the Olympics and I get really excited and I want to do my best there, but I understand that there's some pressures that I have never faced before that I'm going to face. So. I don't, I don't really know if that answers your question, but that's my answer to it. It depends on what value you place on whatever it is you're competing in. Okay. Um, quick answers now. Do you train your eyes how? Yes. This is, ooh, maybe that's not answer this. Yes, I do. I train them with synaptic. Yeah, we both train our eyes, and we, we are going to do like a three or four series podcast. You don't have to say that part. Huh? Well, that's well, now, why we're now you know. Yeah. Okay, so okay. yes, we do train our eyes. I train my currently. I train my eyes more right now than I'm actually shooting, um, and I use the synaptic strobe glasses. So if you're interested in those or don't know what they are, we're fixing to do a podcast with them, so you can learn all about them. And uh, we're actually, I guess I can say this now because we're actually going to be doing a giveaway for some synaptic strobe glasses. So stay tuned for some more information on that. But training, very cool. training the eyes, yes, 100%. Okay, um, will a pro team in Ohio have a winning record this year? No. <laughs> Actually, yes, the Browns will. I think the Browns got this. 
Uh, will you get the Olympic rings tattoo? Yes, um, I have right now. So this is actually, a, I'll, I'll tell you a story, but if you can see it right now, I have a tattoo right here and it's the laurel wreath. And it's the wreath that you see that's around the Olympic rings tattoo, not Olympic rings tattoo, it's the wreath that you see around the Olympic rings. And long story short, if you Google my name, my name in Greek, I think is what it is. I, it's been a very long time since I looked it up, but it means the laurel wreath. So that's where this tattoo came from. And now that I've made the Olympic team, I do plan to put the rings in there because there's a lot of meaning behind it rather than just making the Olympic team. Um, when are you getting that new Ram 2500 with the 12 inch screen to keep up with the Tesla? I actually have a Tesla Cybertruck on order. Yeah, but that, that Ram couldn't keep up with Tesla. No way. <laughs> Leave it in the dust. <laughs> Every chance I get, and this is probably frowned upon, so if there's any cops listening, I always obey the speed limit. But every chance I get, I someone wants to race me. Like the other day, a, a challenger came up and wanted to race and left them in the dust. I mean, they had no chance. Not a prayer. Um, will the Bills make the playoffs? No. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> When are we going to go drinking in New York? I'm going to say what we should do is next time we're in New York, we should have a live at five at the clubhouse in Rochester oh, that would Brooks. That would be fun. And they have a bar there. That would be really and we fun. Because we have a huge fan base in New York, so that would be cool. Uh, let's say If your NFL team is on the road to Vegas, is that now your Vegas weekend? I don't understand that. Does that mean... Like, go to Vegas to watch the NFL team play? I don't know. Art, re-clarify. Please. Uh, shot cam or not to shot cam when shooting bunker trap? Shot cam. If you're talking in training reference, 100% shot cam. Um, Is it even legal in a match? You cannot use it in a match. That's why I said training purposes only. Um, you can't use any kind of enhancement like that during a match. Actually, that's a really good question. I don't know, but I'm gonna. Almost guaranteed. I'm not. almost guaranteed you cannot use it during a match, but for training purposes, 100%. Highly, highly recommend shot cam. If you training. can't even have a smartwatch, there's no way you can have a shot. Yeah, cam. we can't. I can't even wear a smartwatch because anything Bluetooth related and shot cam does have Bluetooth where you can play it back on your phone. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and say no that that's illegal because. It would be very easy for my dad or somebody to connect to the shot cam and watch the shot and what happened and then like tell me what happened. So it would be coaching online. So I'm going to say no. But training purposes, yes. Um, back to my first question. When do I need to come down to Arkansas with new duck calls for y'all to teach David how to blow one? <laughs> please. He, please, Trevor. I'm assuming that's Trevor. Yeah. Yeah, please, Trevor. Come down anytime. I'm going to say sooner the better because I need some practice. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Colo as a guest. Yeah, I'm going to have Dr. Richard Colo on as a guest, and we're also going to be hopefully getting Edward Lyons on as a guest. Um, uh, so, yes for that. Uh, MJ or LeBron in a game of one-on-one? -on -one. I'm going to let Kaylee answer that first because many of you don't know. She's actually a really good basketball player. Yeah. Tom C. has challenged me to um, like a one-on-one -on -one playoff. And for those of y'all that don't know, I could have went and played in college for basketball, but I chose shooting. And uh, what what was the question? I MJ got? or LeBron in a game of one-on-one -on -one in their mm. prime. Oh, that's a hard one. That would be a real. I'm gonna say that would be like a 50-50. No, you can't do that. Match there. That would be a good one. I'm gonna go LeBron. I would say LeBron. Smart. Very smart decision. I would say LeBron. He comes across. I don't know either one of them personally. This is from the outside looking in and watching them play. But he come, LeBron comes across to me as he is takes a more analytical approach to the game. And there's pr probably not something that MJ is going to do that's going to surprise him. But I feel like LeBron might surprise MJ. <laughs> I'm getting deep here. My, my response to that question is, is uh, out of 10 games, LeBron wins 7. And... The reason why I say that is because I'm being a huge fan of basketball and I've watched every game of Michael Jordan that's on YouTube and I've been to a season's worth of uh, Cavs games and I'm a huge Cavs fan. Uh, in fact, I choose to wear a Cavs hat over sponsors' hats while I'm shooting. Um, but 
the and then also my knowledge of professional athletes in general. If you go back to when Michael Jordan played basketball, even though it's not that long ago, the 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 change in uh, my dad said no Jordan. I don't even know who you are right now. <laughs> I guess my dad's Michael Jordan. <laughs> the ch- the change in the the scientific approach to sports at a holistic level in the past decade or two has totally changed professional sports like the NBA. And and what I mean is the approach to physical fitness, the approach to nutrition, the approach to to everything, the studying the game, the IQ of the of the players, um, and players as a whole in the NBA are better now as they were uh, in the Jordan era. And for LeBron to be as good as he, I mean, if it's a question over who's better, straight up LeBron or Michael Jordan, uh, and you're comparing them in their own timelines, they're they're fairly equal yeah. in terms of how much they stand out from other NBA players. In terms of if you bring Jordan into the LeBron era, I think that I think that LeBron is a better player than Michael Jordan. Um, That's good. Yeah. That's pretty. That's a deep one. Uh, <laughs> everybody that grew up watching Jordan is going to say that he's better. Everybody that grew up watching LeBron is going to say he's better. Um, yeah, Trevor said the exact same thing. 7 out of 10. Jordan scores 55 with the flu. <laughs> this is true. Kobe scored 84 with the flu. Um... Let's see. Did, did I skip some questions? Oh, yeah. Holy crap. We missed a lot of questions. Uh, ever be in Virginia for lessons? Yeah. Um, There's demand for it. Yeah. D- definitely check my um, check my teaching schedule yeah, on my we're website. Wor- yeah. We're working on... Um, I say we're because I have now taken over David's management because... What? He just... He needs some help. So he is getting his teaching schedule together... Uh, we're working on it this week, actually. So hopefully it'll be... We, well, we'll keep it as up-to-date as we know new places and new shoots and things start to open up. So look on the website and... Um, I think that's about all. Cool. So I said MJ's bank account would not agree. I don't know. LeBron signed the biggest deal with Nike in the history of the company. Yeah, it was but so look big. at look at all like the Jordans and the shoes and I mean he's like an ongoing thing. It's not like a one time con you know, contracts in, so Well yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Michael like, Jordan, Jordan shoes will be around for forever. Yeah. But Ever. if you look at the marketing plan for Nike, as soon as LeBron retires, it's gonna be the same thing. Maybe. I haven't looked at the marketing plan for Nike. They don't include me on their marketing <laughs> plan very often. There will be a shift in... There's going to be... Like, there are Jordans. There'll be LeBrons. Yes. Am I going to answer his emails? I am on top of him. How much did I ask you daily if you've answered emails? Yeah, she does. Liter- literally daily. When we wake up, I say, what emails do you have to answer? What do you have to do today? And I make him make a list. So... If you if you if he has not answered your email, he will within the week if it's a new email, um, because I stay on top of him on that. Here's the ser- here's the serious I- issue with that, is that I get so many emails that only I can answer. There, it's not um, something that I can farm out to somebody that I can hire. It's not something that even Kaylee could answer. Uh, and so the problem, and then they're not answer they're not emails that I can just write a two or three sentence response to on a, on a daily basis. The emails that I get require pages of a response and something that exactly only I can answer. So, uh, the emails do, do, uh, fill up. And, uh, fortunately I don't have, uh, a nine to five job where I can sit on a computer and answer emails all day. But, um, you know, they go, they, they go out as quickly as I can. And if you, if you need to get a hold of me for something that's serious and I can't, and I'm not responding, don't feel bad to just keep sending stuff to me because my phone goes off so much it's hard to keep track of. So don't feel bad about that. Uh, but that's the. But the, I do stay on top of him of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, Painter. I know you're joking. I'm just saying. Uh, I wonder how people are retracting lessons. 
Okay, so Duke says we need to go to Virginia for lessons and coaching. There's a lot of beautiful uh, places there. Yeah, if y'all, if there's an area that's not on um, his schedule, send us an email because if there's enough of a demand there, like Virginia, for example, if there's enough of a demand there, I mean, we definitely can make a trip there to, to coach. I mean, yeah. that's not, not the a other problem. Thing that, the other thing that we're doing is, uh, you know, very shortly – we're going to be able to have people to come here. And although it might seem kind of like, uh, you know, a little bit out of the way to, tr to travel to some place to, to take a lesson, the huge benefit in coming to us to take a lesson is that when I go other places to take a lesson uh, or to give lessons, I'm not in control of the uh, scenario around me, the target setting. And so basically I have to adjust my teaching to what I have there to teach on. Mm -hmm. If you come here... Um, we don't have that problem. And so I yeah. can, we can, you know, have a very targeted and focused, uh, less lesson session. We can spread it out over two or three days. Um, yeah. just really quickly. Why don't we give like just a really quick description of what we have here and what's going in here. I know well, we, we don't need to do that's That's do the video we were talking about. More well, that something. we will to like reveal it, but just like really quickly, we have, we're in the process of building the lodge, which y'all know that, Cypress Creek Lodge. And like I mentioned earlier, on the facility here, we have International Trap, American Trap, Sporting Plays, B-Task. And then we have the capability to put in some of the towers that we were talking about. But basically, uh, what we want to get it to is like a training facility here. Y'all can come here, book a lesson, fly down here. You stay at the lodge. You can come a Thursday through a Sunday or however long. We're going to have clinics here. We're gonna have David's gonna have sporting place clinics here. I'm gonna have bunker clinics here as well as ATA, um, and basically it's an all-inclusive package. So that includes your meals, your drinks, your targets, everything. And you come here and you have a place to stay on the facility. And um, don't even need to rent a car. We'll pick you up if you fly. Yeah, the the airport is 40 minutes away, 35 minutes away, 40 minutes with traffic. 20 minutes um, in a Tesla. 20 minutes in my Tesla because it's fast, but. Um, yeah, so that is what we're, we have the capability to have people here currently because we do have a cabin, it sleeps four people, um, but we're doing this on a bigger scale, so the lodge isn't finished yet, but that's the idea of it. We can have, be, we have the facility here now currently, the only thing we're lacking is the lodge to be able to host multiple people here for a clinic. So, with that being said, that was long-winded, but with that being said, um, we are starting to open up for lessons here. So if we can't make it up to you, like if you're in Virginia or something like that, that we don't typically go to or that David doesn't typically go to, reach out to us because we might can make something happen to where you come here. So yeah. We just had a student of mine come for yeah, a half a week, week and yeah. it was awesome. I mean, he had a beautiful place to stay here uh, and it was really good. Yeah, so. Uh, Minnesota, I freaking love Minnesota and I, and I have a couple friends that own clubs there. So yes, I would love to teach up there. Uh, I hunt up there, so I might as well teach. Mm -hmm. uh, James Cooper says we should both do a clinic together. I'm trying to get her to come to Rochester with me. Yeah, I would love to come to Rochester. Um, how do we find out about Cypress Creek? We are going to continue to update that on our personal Instagrams and beyond the podium um, because it's kind of shooting related, to on yeah. what's going on. But once the building is actually up, I think we're probably going to create some sort of Instagram, social media. Probably a page on our website would be more realistic uh, for the Cypress Creek Lodge. And you can book your stay there, book a lesson there. And also we're going to try to figure out how to correlate it to where if you book a lesson with David, you can choose you know, if you want it here or if he has a clinic booked or s something along those lines. But we'll keep you updated on the lodge and the process that like, that's going on right there. But... If you want to, if you're interested in doing something currently before the lodge is done, we do have the cabin, so just send us an email, um, any of our emails, info at beyondthepodiumpodcast.com or David's email or my email, which you can find on the websites. So that was also very long-winded, but anything else you got? Uh, <clears throat> Trevor's saying we should teach at Hopkins. That would be cool. Good mm -hmm. idea. Uh, and then... Saying uh, over at Yorkshire when we're over there, that would be really cool. Yeah, I love teaching over there too. But yeah, yeah that'd be good. So, yeah, cool. Well, we're Sweet, gonna guys. wrap it up here. We appreciate y'all sticking with us through my idea to do it on Instagram and 
Facebook and David's Instagram you and YouTube. You're not having any more ideas. Listen, trial and error, okay? It could have really been it like could have worked out really five well. Five strikes in a row so far. If y'all are wondering about how the carpet turned out, it is phenomenal. Yeah, af say. after tell them what we had to do. Well, I had to have a cleaning company come and steam it because there was so much soap in it. It was ridiculous. Uh, and water. And yeah, and water. So we had to have a cleaning company come and like steam it out, and then I had to let it like sit outside for a day to like dry out. But it is now very clean. It's like the cleanest it's ever been, and it smells so good. It smells like like fresh linens. It smells really good mm. now. <laughs> but I don't recommend the approach I took <laughs> on the rug. It's probably not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. All right. Sounds good, guys. We appreciate y'all sticking with us and thanks so much for being so active with us today that, yeah, was, that was fun that was really fun and um we're probably going to do some more video analysis so uh keep sending us your videos we have a lot of videos to go over but we just wanted to interact with y'all today and answer your questions and tell y'all updates and what's going on here so um look forward to or y'all keep your notifications on um, because we have another episode on the podcast releasing tomorrow, so make sure to listen to that. And I just want to also tell y'all, again, please like, subscribe, follow, all of that, because it gets to a point on YouTube to where we can make it to where it's more of a benefit for y'all, like on our giveaways and some of the merch and stuff, but we have to have you know, a certain amount of subscribers and whatnot. But anyway, so. Perfect. Cool. We'll see y'all guys next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.